السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless his entire household and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all his companions and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and to grant us all goodness. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, the topic I've been given to discuss this afternoon is the impact of the Qur'an. The Qur'an, as you know, is a heavenly book revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over a period of 23 years. And if we take a look at this revelation, we will find that it is the word of the Creator. And this is why it has the strongest impact upon creation, not only man and jinn, but even plantation and the surroundings are impacted by the Qur'an. If you look at the first verses that were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was in this cave known as Hira. When the angel Jibreel or Gabriel alayhi salam came to him and he says, Iqara, read. I'm sure you know that was the first word. Why read? Because reading is of utmost importance. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was unlettered. Allah had chosen it such that he was unable to read or write. He did not learn how to read or write. Like Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِن قَبْلِهِ مِن you did not used to read, recite. Can I use this? Yes. You did not used to read, nor did you used to write before this Quran so that the doubters would be able to say something. They cannot doubt. The revelation because you did not read it from elsewhere, nor did you write it. This is a miracle of the Qur'an. So when he was told Iqra, he was 40 years old, an honest man, very honest. It's not easy for us today, if you're 40 years old and someone says, can you please send out uh, a little message? And suddenly a person tells you, I don't know how to use a mobile phone. 40 years old, you want to admit that you don't know? You know, some people would actually read a newspaper in a language they don't know to pretend that they know it. And the only way they would know how to put it the proper way around is through the photographs. So if there are no photographs, they might be holding that newspaper the other way around. People would laugh at them. What are you doing? But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was an honest, upright man. Immediately he said, Ma'ana biqari. I'm not a reader. I don't read which means unlettered. Amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, I'm not satisfied with this microphone, ya akhi. It's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the Muslim ummah by revealing the book to a man who was unlettered. Yet, he could read into situations better than myself and yourselves. And he was a person who was the most highly educated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although one thing was missing and that was the ability to read and write. So for someone to say he was uneducated is wrong because look at what he came with. He was educated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is the source of all knowledge. And to this day, with us who are able to read and write, anyone who does not read thoroughly is a fool. 
Anyone who does not read thoroughly is a fool. We need to read to understand. Understand your duty. Understand others. Understand where they come from. Understand who they are. Understand your duty and your interaction with people and your duty unto your maker. This is what will make you a better person. So today when they say this man is uneducated, they're thinking of a barbaric person, perhaps from one corner of the third world and so on. And when they say this guy has a PhD, they're talking of someone who's been to college for so many years. But do you know something? Sometimes someone with a PhD could actually be having less common sense than a person who did not really go to school. It happens to this day where you have a person who's highly qualified and yet the common sense they don't have, not at all. They cannot add one and one. I always say sometimes PhD holders are so fascinated with their degrees that they say two and two makes five. They put two and two together and they tell you this is five. It happens and it is happening on a global level. May Allah bless us all. May He grant us the wisdom, the knowledge, the education, the ability to really read and write. And may He make us from those who can benefit. So the first word, Iqra, it has an impact on all of us. That's the first word. And that impact is, it is the root of who you are as a Muslim, who you are as a human being. The message is for humanity at large, mankind and jinn kind. So Iqra, and I want to invite you to read, not only read the Quran, read the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but read as much as you can so that you can educate yourself. You know, they say, Subhanallah, and this is amazing, that if you just listen to someone without verifying and without authenticating a story they have or without authenticating perhaps a narration they have, you may begin to believe something that is absolutely untrue or you may begin to divert yourself thinking that you've benefited in a big way. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, use your common sense, use your mind, use your brain. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Let's take a quick look at what happened thereafter. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa received the first verses, Iqra, the order to read, and the instruction to continue reading in the name of your Rabb who has created you from a clot of blood and so on. Thereafter, he came down from that mount and he rushed to his wife. Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha. And he told her what happened. He says, this is what happened. Jibreel came to me and he took me, he embraced me, he released me, he repeated the words again and again and so on. And she said, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abadan. Nay, Allah will never ever let you down. You will never ever be from amongst those who is let down. Or who is destroyed by Allah, who, who receives negativity. Why? Because you are a person who fulfills the rights of your neighbor. You are the one who fulfills the rights of the families. And meaning you look into family ties and maintain them in the best way. You help the orphan and the widows. You are a just, upright, honest person. So Allah will not let you down, subhanAllah. And she then took him to one of her cousins, Waraka bin Nawfal, and the story continues. But to take a look at Khadija herself and how this initial revelation impacted on her, she knew it was the truth because it came from a truthful man. And she knew that he was such a good man that Allah would not allow for him to be from amongst those who was affected negatively by this beautiful message of the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may He grant us the positivity of the Quran. So that is just the beginning of revelation. If we take a look at another incident that occurred not a long time after that, where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was instructed to gather the people and to warn them. Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'anthir O you who is enveloped in garments. Get up and warn the people. Warn them about what? About the fact that they need to answer to their maker. The answerability. They will answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When these verses were revealed, it took the da'wah and the propagation to a new level. And that was the level of 
open call where Muhammad sallallahu called his tribesmen and the people of Mecca, selected people of Mecca to the Mount Safa. And when he gathered them there, remember he was known as a Sadiqul Amin, the trustworthy, the honest one. When he gathered them there, he asked them a question. He said, you on this side of the mountain, if I were to inform you that the enemy is on the other side of the mountain, would you believe me? Simple question. It's a question of integrity and honesty. If I were to tell you, whilst you are on this side, that on the other side there is an enemy, would you believe me? Immediately, the leaders of Makkah and the mushrikeen, the polytheists, and all of those relatives who were gathered there, they said, yes indeed, you are a truthful man. We know you as a sadiqul amin, the truthful, the honest. So he says, well I want to warn you of a punishment that is about to come if you continue in your bad ways and habits. And I want to inform you, and I want to re tell you about the fact that I am sent to you in order to guide you to the believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe in your maker, worship him alone, and I am a messenger unto you. Immediately people started saying things. Immediately people started saying, he's a liar, he's a traitor, he's a magician, he's a womanizer, he's behind money, he's behind this and behind that. And one man whose name was Abu Lahab, who was one of the uncles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Tabbalaka ya Muhammad, alihada jama'atana, we can translate that as, woe be unto you, or destruction unto you, O Muhammad. Is this why you gathered all of us here? You know, we are VIPs, important people. You gathering us just to tell us that you're a messenger? Who do you think you are? Destruction unto you. Is this why you gathered us here? What happened? As a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one entire surah. تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبَّ مَا أَغْنَىٰ عَنْهُ مَالٌ وَمَا كَسَبٍ سَيَصْلَىٰ نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبٍ وَامْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبٍ فِي جِيدِهَا حَبْلٌ مِّن مَّسَدٍ Amazing. Amazing. I'll give you a little bit of homework to check the meaning of that inshallah. But at the same time, let me tell you the gist of it. Allah revealed verses saying, Destruction be upon both of the hands, all the abilities and capabilities of this Abu Lahab. A great destruction be upon him. He used the same word, Tabbal laka ya Muhammad, and Allah revealed verses, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watabba. And the verses continued. And do you know what the impact was? The little children of Mecca memorized these verses and they enjoyed repeating them because of how beautiful they sounded and because of how they rhymed and because of the powerful meaning of it. So this man could not stop the impact of the Qur'an. And he was shocked because as one of the top leaders of Mecca who just insulted the Messenger of Allah, Allah did decided to choose this impact of the Qur'an that was on the hearts of the little children of Mecca who were innocent to repeat these verses because they loved them. And so he didn't know where to put his face. Everyone is saying, Tabbat yada abi wa tabba ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Look at this. See the impact of the Qur'an? It is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِن مُدَّكِرِ We have indeed made this Qur'an very easy to understand. Anyone from amongst you willing to do that, willing to try and understand it? We have indeed made this Qur'an very easy to memorize. Any one of you ready to try and memorize it? MashaAllah, in our midst, I'm sure we have so many people who've memorized the Qur'an. And I'm sure all of us, or most of us, if not all of us, have memorized at least Surah Al-Fatiha. Put up your hands if you've memorized Surah Al-Fatiha. That's 99.99% if not 100. Subhanallah. So the Quran has such an impact that it's easy to memorize. You've all just confirmed with me that you've memorized. Now I want you to put up your hand if you speak the Arabic language. Put up your hand. 
Subhanallah, less than 2% of us or three, Subhanallah. Some are saying, you know, 50-50, Subhanallah. So, so, come see, come sa, Subhanallah. To be honest, that is the impact of the Quran. You don't speak Arabic, but you know it. You have memorized it. That's the word of Allah. People say, why don't we sideline the Arabic because we don't know it? And why don't we just look at the English and memorize the English? The reality is, English cannot be memorized even by its own author. If someone were to write a book, or you were to write a page in English to memorize it completely top to bottom, maybe depending on how dedicated you are, you might struggle and get that, but the others will never be able to do that. And if it was more than a page, I don't think you would do it as well. Subhanallah. The Quran, it becomes strong. It enters the heart. Whether you know the Arabic language or not is besides the point. You will be finding it very, very easy to memorize. The reason why we cannot delete the Arabic, that is the word of Allah. He spoke it. The English is only an attempt to try and translate what the translator believes is the best or the most accurate way of explaining what Allah is saying. This is why normally we have taught, we are taught as Muslimin, if you want to translate the word of Allah, ensure that you have the Arabic on one side and the English and make sure that you have said this is a translation. Why the Arabic on one side? Because the confirmed word of Allah, this is it. I will memorize it as is. It has a bigger impact than anything else in existence in speech. Bigger impact. If someone says this speech is powerful, one of the reasons why? Because the Quran is mentioned in it. If it is something to do with your spirituality from the Quran, from the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu it has a different impact. I'm sure you would notice Muslims and non-Muslims. If I were to recite a verse during my speech in the Arabic language, it creates a totally different feeling. It has an impact that you definitely bear witness to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this is the Quran. Allah is telling us, we have made it easy for you to memorize. Have you memorized it? We have made it easy to understand. Have you attempted to understand it? So I challenge you with both these challenges. Brothers and sisters, how many of us are ready to memorize a little bit more than we have already memorized? Subhanallah. It has such a big impact. There we have so many hands, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may He open our doors. One more. How many of us are ready to make an effort to understand it? Yet, we do not understand much. MashaAllah, I've seen most of the hands there. Alhamdulillah. Do you know, do you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Quran for us to look into its verses and ponder deeply over them? That is the duty of a Muslim. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ A book we have revealed unto you, blessed, in order that you may ponder very deeply over its verses. Subhanallah. <coughs> A book that we have revealed to you, blessed, in order that you may ponder very deeply over its verses. And for it to act as a reminder for those with sound intellect. That's what Allah says. So if you have sound intellect, it will act as a reminder for you to be the best human being possible. And at the same time, prepare for the day you meet with Allah. Amazing. The Prophet Muhammad says, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنفَعُهُمْ nas." Have you ever heard that hadith? Where he says, the best of people are those who are most beneficial to the rest of the people. Ask yourself, how much have I benefited the rest of the people? Like I always say, even the non-Muslims, how have you benefited them? Every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. That's how we look at them. Every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. Have you helped in any way to try and benefit a non-Muslim so that they can see the beauty of Islam? So that they can see that at least Islam is a heavenly religion. So that they can see at least that this is really something I need to consider. If the answer is no, oh, you haven't understood the Quran. You haven't understood the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His Messenger. Like we say, it's about time we as Muslimin looked into the Quran, 
And we pondered very deeply over its verses because Allah warns us yet in another verse. He says, أَفَلَا يَتَجَبَّعُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُوهَا Will they not? Will they not ponder very deeply over the verses of the Qur'an? Or are the locks of the Qur'an on their hearts? What are the locks of the Qur'an? Let me give you an example. Some people will study one or two verses of the Qur'an. It will have such a big impact on them that their lives will change positively. And some people will read the Qur'an from cover to cover and it has no impact on them. Cover to cover. Why? Because of the sincerity levels. Because of the level of the heart. Because of the genuineness. Because they are not looking at it with the right eyes. Subhanallah. I can give you a few examples. Powerful example. There was a man, an enemy of Islam. One of the strongest and most powerful enemies of Islam. His name was Umar ibn al-Khattab. Radiallahu anhu later to be known as. He was such an enemy of Islam that people dared take the name of Islam in his presence or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in his presence and people dared take his name. He was such a powerful man. He was known to be ruthless and he was known to be a person you had to stay away from. This was Umar. When they saw him walking, they were frightened. Powerful man. And so one day he decided, let me get rid of this Muhammad. You know, he's in Mecca and he's really contaminating everyone's mind. Now, why did he think that? Because he did not read. That's the reason. Today, the non-Muslims think Islam is bad or people from amongst the Muslims are bad because they don't read. The minute they read, they will know otherwise. This is what we say. The minute they read, they will know otherwise. That's what happened to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He did not read. So he had really a, a, a belief in his heart, in his mind that this is barbaric and this man is useless and he's come with rules and regulations in order to destroy everyone and to do this and that. And he decided, let me go and get rid of him. So he takes his sword and he walks out of his house. And a man meets him and sees, wow, I'm reading danger here, something wrong. So he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Muhammad. I want to now get rid of him. And that's it. He says, well, you know what? Your sister has accepted his call. Why don't you start with her? Why don't you go to her home? This was a way of trying to get him to divert a little bit. He said, good idea. Let me go there first. So he ends up at his sister's home. When he enters the home, he, he notices or he knocks on the door. And a while later, the door opens. And he notices or he senses there was some helter skelter there, you know, which means people seem to have hidden something they were perhaps doing. There is an uneasy feeling here. What were you guys doing? What were you doing? Nothing. What is it you thought, you know? No. He began to beat his sister up. Fatima bint al-Khattab, radiallahu anha. He was so upset, he began to beat her up until she bled. And when he saw this blood, some of the narrations make mention of how he felt this feeling within him. What am I doing? This is my sister. What am I doing? So what? You know, today we teach across the globe. We teach everyone saying, you have a few differences. You know, instead of becoming violent about them, you need to discuss your differences. And sometimes you need to agree to disagree. You're a human being. Your life in this world is short. Perhaps 60 to 70 years as per the saying of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So achieve something meaningful. Touch the lives of others in the most blessed way. Teach them some goodness. You, you will have differences even with your own spouse. Does that mean everyone who... Or if we had to say everyone who has a difference with their spouse, divorce them, none of us would be married. Do you know that? Not one. So we are taught to understand each other. So Umar ibn Khattab looks, he sees this blood and he says, no, tell me what is it you were doing? And they said, look, we were reading the Quran. We have it on a little parchment and you know, we, uh, this is what was happening. Okay, give it to me. He calmed down a little bit. I want to read it. Well, you need to cleanse yourself. And he cleansed himself. He came, they gave him this little piece of, uh, you know, uh, the parchment that it was written on, a little skin uh, or a piece of wooden uh, material that it was written on, whatever it was at the time and he looks into it and do you know he read not more than four verses the opening verses of surah taha let me read them for you 
these impacted on him to the degree that he began to cry. Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an litashqa illa tazkiratan liman yakhsha tanzilan mimman khalaqa al-arda wal-samawati al-ula Allahu Akbar Taha you ask me, what's the meaning of that? I have to tell you the famous statement, Allah alone knows. It is to draw the attention of the people who think they are very eloquent. There is only one small little aspect of it. But if you were to ask me what the precise meaning of it is, I will tell you Allah has kept it with His knowledge. Taha. And you know why? Let me give you a little info. The reason is we're talking of the impact of the Qur'an. Muhammad sallallahu was the most eloquent, although he couldn't read or write. Most eloquent. They really loved the speech that came from his mouth, subhanallah. They loved it. They could not deny it. I'll give you a story in a few moments of something else that happened where his own enemies had to admit, hey, there's something here. Subhanallah. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So they, they, they said this man is so eloquent, so eloquent. And they said, do not listen to him. The reason is, if you listen to him, it, it has such a big impact on anyone that they become more or less possessed. Astaghfirullah. So, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَالْغَوْفِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَغْلِبُونَ Allah says, the disbelievers at the time, do you know what they said? Do not listen to this Qur'an. Do not listen to this Qur'an. And whenever it is being recited, make a noise so that you can be the winners. Up to today, the statement is repeated. Don't listen to the Qur'an. If you listen to it, you lose. If you, if, if, you've, if you have a Qur'an in your home, your parents will tell you, Hey, what are you planning to do here? What are you planning to do here? Astaghfirullah. If you have a Qur'an in your bag, people start thinking, Hey, what's going on here? Up to today, they will tell you, Don't read it because it has the truth in it. Subhanallah. And the truth has its own impact. It has its own power. It does not need my power or yours. It has its own power. So the kuffar are saying, do not listen to the Qur'an. Why didn't they say, do not read the Qur'an? Because the bulk of them were unlettered. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ Allah sent to a group of people or to the, to the unlettered, a messenger from amongst them. Which means the bulk of them were unlettered. So this is why Allah says, the kuffar said, don't read the Qur'an. Make noise whilst it is being read, read, so that you will be the winners. You will overcome the others. Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, I call on the globe to read the Qur'an. Just read it. Understand it. And read it with an objective mind to try and understand what is being said. You know, not with a lopsided mind where I'm looking for all those places where it says, you know, bomb the world and so on. A'udhu billah. That is not Islam and it's not even a part of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So, if you look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, he opened with these verses, Taha. I was saying moments ago, they used to listen to this most eloquent man. So, when they heard him, they were told to put their fingers into their ears. They were told, put your fingers into your ears so that you don't listen to it. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, the verses in Mecca at that time, they were short and sharp. Very short and sharp. Take a look at Taha. So people were expecting a very eloquent statement and suddenly he says, Taha. They look at me. What does that mean? And they want to put their fingers into their ears, but the verse is over. It's a verse, it's finished, it's gone. So, what was the impact of it? Wow, well, no point now in putting our fingers in our ears, it's over. But what does Taha mean? So now they're talking about it amongst themselves. What does it mean? This man's supposed to be eloquent. Imagine if you were told, oh, there's a guy coming to speak to you from Zimbabwe and he speaks really, really, you know, good and so on. Or there is a person who is a professor in the English language coming to talk to you and he says, Y O Z. What happened? You're going to tell yourself, what's he trying to prove? What did he just do? Is he making a fool of himself? Yes, 
That's what you would say, that's what I would say. But the reality is, when it comes to the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed blessed verses, which have separated letters in them, definitely one thing that happened as a result was it drew the attention of the most eloquent of the Arabs. And they came in and they then looked at much more of it than just those two separated letters. This is why every surah that starts with separated letters was revealed in Mecca, besides the first two, Alif, Lam, Mim, uh, Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran. Every one of them which has separated letters, close your eyes and say this was revealed in Mecca. You are right. Did you know that? Because this was a miracle. It had an impact. So when Umar ibn Khattab heard it, or he read it, he looked at it, and after that, the next line had an answer to a question that was in his, on his mind for a long, long time, and it is on the mind of a lot of the non-Muslims today, and it is on the minds of some of the weaker Muslims. What is the question? Oh, there are too many rules and regulations in Islam. Nice religion, but whoa, I don't want to give up pork, and I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to, I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy life. My brother, my sister, you are looking for happiness? Well, happiness comes by following the ingredients of happiness and the method of how to achieve it. I cannot bake a cake if I were to put face powder or Johnson's baby powder instead of flour, although the two look the same. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, we have revealed the Qur'an to you, not in order for it to be a point of your sadness or difficulty or your bad luck or a point of destruction. No! We have re- not revealed this Qur'an to you in order for it to be a means of difficulty for you. No! It is in fact a means of your salvation. It is in fact a revelation from the one who created the heavens and the skies and the earth. Subhanallah. So when Umar ibn Khattab read this, he says, Oh, whoa, all these rules and regulations, everything. And at that time, there were not many rules and regulations. More of them came later on. So Allah says, Ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an litashqa. It is only a reminder. Allah says, We have not revealed this Qur'an for it to be a point of uneasiness or difficulty for you. In fact, it is a revelation or it is a reminder for those who fear, those who have a heart. This is why I say you look at the Qur'an with a good heart. Now Umar is looking at it with a good heart. He was told there, it is a reminder for those with humility, those with the fear of Allah, those who are conscious of who they are, where they are, where they are heading. So he looks at it, he begins to cry, he's trembling. How many verses? Not more than just a few. Four. And he says, take me to Muhammad. I'd like to go and embrace Islam. My brothers and sisters, a man who was about to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, read for the first time four little verses of the Qur'an. The impact it had on him because he looked at it with the correct heart and the correct eyes was so powerful that he started trembling and he's asking to go to Muhammad, may peace be upon him in order for him to now accept the message. That's the impact of reading. That is the power of reading. That is the power of knowing the truth with the correct heart. And I say this to a global audience. Believe me, if you were to read with an open heart, you would find the truth very, very easily. But if you do not read, and you're just a person who follows the flow, you will also be from amongst those who has these bad thoughts that are incorrect, inaccurate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed those verses, they impacted on Umar. Let me quickly tell you what happened. They were taken to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam, radiallahu anhu, where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had, was gathered with some of his companions, and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was standing at the door. He was standing at the door and they remember that Muhammad ﷺ had made a prayer. He'd made a dua, a little supplication earlier on. Allahumma a'izz al-Islama bi ahad al Oh Allah, grant strength. Strengthen this deen. Strengthen Islam. Through the acceptance of Islam of one of these well looked up to people of Quraysh. Either Amr ibn Hisham who was known as Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab who was this man we're talking about. And when he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab coming in, 
and asking to come in, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib made a prayer, little supplication. He says, Oh Allah, this is Umar. If he is coming with a good intention, if you intend goodness for him, guide him to the deen. In yuridillahu bihi khayran, yuslim. If Allah wants goodness from him, he will accept the deen. And if he intends anything otherwise, then let it be easy for us to overpower him. Allahu Akbar. And so when he was allowed to enter, Muhammad sallallahu seated in the midst of his companions, and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu comes in and suddenly declares. Imagine everyone's waiting for some statement and people are worried. Wow, Umar just walked in. They know who he was. Those four verses impacted such that he says, Ya Rasulallah, inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu annaka abduhu wa rasooluhu. O Messenger of Allah, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I bear witness that you are the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They were shocked, they were in tears, they were crying. They were declaring the greatness of Allah. Amazing. How did this happen? The impact of the Qur'an. Four verses. I want to pause there for a moment. We read the Qur'an cover to cover, don't we? We read its meaning, mashallah, I hope we will read it with a little bit more concentration and more deep pondering, inshallah. But we read it cover to cover sometimes and we cover it in the month of Ramadan by listening to it in Taraweeh. Sometimes it has not impacted upon us at all. We have not even quit the adultery we've been committing, the gambling we've been doing, the intoxicants we've been taking, and so many other bad habits, the pornography we might be hooked on to. We cannot even quit these small little things. Why? Because we've not read it with the right heart. We've not looked at it with the correct eyes. The enemies of Islam looked at it with the correct eyes and they were guided never to look at misguidance again. Today, the reverts to Islam, I'd like to think, are sometimes much more powerful in faith and belief than those who were born Muslims. I find this because they have seen the darkness. And they know, they looked at the Qur'an with the right eye. They look at you and they'll say, but hang on, you guys are Muslims. You are supposed to be people who understand the gift you're upon. Islam is the fastest growing religion. Even though it's difficult to even confirm today that you're a Muslim. It is today if a person accepts Islam, it is so difficult for them because the whole world will look at them, starting with their own family members in most cases, with such an evil eye. What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? But still, Islam is the fastest growing because there are people out there who are reading. They are not foolish and they are looking at it with a good heart and with the right eyes. So I call on you. It's about time we read a few verses that woke us up, shook us. Let me give you another example. When Muhammad ﷺ in Mecca used to read the Quran in the evenings at, in the dark, the kuffar, the leaders of Quraysh, they used to tell everyone, don't listen to this word, don't listen to it at all. And they used to silently, without anyone knowing, thinking that no one is knowing, they used to tiptoe and go right to his place and listen to the beautiful recitation of the Quran. Remember, these were Arabs, so they understood exactly what was being said. So he used to read and they used to listen. Who were they? Three names are mentioned. Al-Akhnas ibn Shurayt, Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan. Three names are mentioned. These three, very amazingly, they went at night, the first night, none of them knew that the other was also around listening in the darkness. They didn't know. And when they finished, they got up and they were walking away and they bumped into each other. Hey, what are you doing here at this time of the night? Hey, what are you doing here at this time of the night? Well, what are you doing here at this time of the night? It's like a guy saying, you know what? Uh, let me give you an example on a lighter note. It's like a guy saying, ho, 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 ho. Do you know how many Muslims were at that nightclub? Brother, how do you know? <laughs> Question, isn't it? Wow. He tells, you know, I was there to take out my son. Wow, we all know about the sons that were taken out, isn't it? May Allah protect us all. So this is what was happening to these three. One tells the other, what are you doing here? He says, well, what are you doing here? And the third one says, what about you? And they all admitted, okay, look, we came here to listen to this. It was, you know, it was something else amazing. Okay, promise you never going to come back again. We promise by our gods and our idols, we'll never be back here again. Come on, we are leaders here. If we are seen here, it's a big insult, you know. 
Allahu Akbar. You know, for a leader to enter the fold of Islam today, just imagine you have to hear a world leader embracing Islam. Ooh, that is something. He will, he will really have to be a solid, strong Muslim because... To be honest with you, he is going to have to take a lot of flack. As it is, ordinary people like myself and yourselves already take flack. Allahu Akbar. So, here you have these three promising each other, hey, don't do this again, we won't. Guess what? The following night, the Quran has such an impact. They were all there again, the exact same three of them. Do you know that? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So now they're listening. No one knows the, that the other is there and they bump into each other on the road again. Same thing happened. Hey, 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 hey. You're in the nightclub a second time? What are you telling me, man? Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us all. They're looking at each other. Never again they took their oaths the second time. Lo and behold, you're not going to believe this. They were here, they were there for the third time, the third day running. That's the impact of the Qur'an. Like I said yesterday in the Jumu'ah talk, I said, if you get up for Salatul Tahajjud in the early hours of the morning, for the sake of Allah, between you and Him alone, believe me, that prayer at that time of the morning has such an impact that it will, it has such a magnetism with it, it will invite you. It will attract you. It will make you go back at some stage to saying it and reading it and fulfilling it once again. Try it out. It works. If you do it for the sake of Allah, you get up early morning, you wash your hands, you do your wudu and you read your tahajjud a few raka'at, you make your dua, you can go back to bed or you can wait for Salatul Fajr. See how you feel. That feeling, people are willing to pay millions of dollars in order to feel that feeling that Islam has already given you. The wealthiest of the world. I was just telling my brothers a few moments ago, I watched a clip yesterday of a brother who was a multi-millionaire. He's had everything and he could not find happiness and he found it in Islam. Somehow Allah guided him to Islam. And he says, I found the happiness. And you know what that brother says? He says, I tattooed on my head, I love money. This is, these are his words. That's how he was. He tattooed it on his head. I love money. And he says, I became a Muslim and I want to tell the Muslims that I see the young Muslims, the little Muslim boys and girls, and they have the same tattoo, but it's on their hearts, not on their heads. And yet they don't know that Islam has given them much more than what they're running after. Look at this man's words. He's seen the world. He's owned everything. He's had the life. The life that a lot of people might want to look up to and say, wow, that's it. He's got the cars and the houses and everything at the flick of a finger. And he is telling the Muslims, you know what? Do not allow your heart to be tattooed by I love money because money does not bring about happiness. To be honest with you, the happiest of people are those who perhaps have far less than the average individual from amongst us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So the third day, they say to each other, no ways, you're not going to listen to this, we're never coming back. And they took big, big oaths and they were never ever back there again. But this is the impact of the Qur'an. It draws you, it brings you back. Try to read melodious Qur'an yourself. And you find it will soothe you. Listen to melodious reading, it will soothe you, it will calm you. Really. I saw a clip that was on CNN some time back. I saw it on the internet a few days ago. It says, in Russia, there is a flower called the Adhan flower. Have you ever heard of it? Adhan flower. You can Google it and you can check it. Some of you are nodding your heads. It actually blossoms. It opens up when the Adhan is called and it closes thereafter. Wallahi, see there are people raising their hands. I've got it on my phone. The clip is there. It was on CNN. The same guys who tell you quite a bit of lies sometimes. At least they spoke some truth. So to be honest with you, it's amazing, it's amazing how a plant responds to the adhan. Do you know that? Do you? That's the, that's the question. Wallahi, go and check it on YouTube. You will feel ashamed of yourself. When, when the muaddin calls out, Hayyan al Come 
come to success. The little flower opens. It's coming to success. It surrenders to Allah. And Allah says this in the Quran. The impact of the words given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a plant and you're telling me the Quran has not impacted you? Something wrong. May Allah open our doors. May He make us from those who can answer the call to prayer. We have the solutions. It's only up to us to look at it with the correct eyes. It's about time we got up. So this was the example of those three. And this is how even Abu Sufyan, one might ask, how do you know the story? How did we know the story? Because if, if they were the three leaders, Abu Sufyan later on became a Muslim. Do you know that? And the story came out. Everyone knows that this is what happened. And we really looked at Islam. If you look at so many different incidents, and I'm going to give you one more incident, or maybe perhaps two more, seeing that we don't have much time. They chose a man from amongst the people of Quraysh to go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to offer him whatever he wants to give up his statements. We will make you the, key, the king or the leader. We will make you the wealthy from amongst us if wealth is what you're looking for. We will let you marry whomsoever you wish from the most beautiful of women if that's what you want. And we will give you, we will make you our leader. We will do this and do that. But give up your statement. Don't call people to worshipping one God. Do you know what Muhammad wasallam said? He says, Wallahi, if you were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, and you were to ask me to quit, I wouldn't. Then he began to recite verses. The opening verses of Hamim as sajda or what is known as Surah Fussilat. Hamim tanzilun min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim kitabun fussilat ayatuhu Qur'anan arabiyyan liqawmi ya'lamun And he continued reading. And this man was just looking at him and listening. And he knows, this is one of the leaders of Quraysh. He knows the meaning of it. When Muhammad ﷺ got to the verses where Allah says, If they turn away, warn them of a similar punishment that struck Ad and Thamud. This man takes his hand and blocks the mouth of Muhammad ﷺ and says, Stop, 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 stop. I don't want to hear anymore. And he walks away. Because he knows that we don't want to hear what type of punishment has come to them. If he thought it was a tale, he would have allowed him to carry on. He would have made a joke about it. No jokes made. Nothing. Serious man. And he knew. He stopped him. He said, hey, hang on. I'm going. He went away. He went back to Quraysh, gathered them. He gathered the cronies. And he tells them, you know what? I just heard verses. Some revelation. It cannot be the speech of man. It has a sweetness in it. It has such an impact. It has this. Then he said, hang on. We sent you to tell him something. You coming back to preach to us? That's the impact of the Qur'an. That's the impact of the Qur'an. But at that moment, shaitan overtook this man. He says, no, no, no. I'm only telling you something. I'm not actually trying to convince you and so on. May Allah bless us. And all those who are on the verge of Islam, it's up, it's up to you to make, take the step. To take the step. Yes, you will face a lot of what you face. But you make the difference, inshallah. You take the step. And Allah will guide you rightly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. We don't want to be from someone who knows the truth. Look at this man. He knew what was right. But he was just worried about his people. So he said, you know what? Uh, I, I was just telling you guys. It's not like I'm going to accept it and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and open our doors. The last example I want to give you is of an Ethiopian king. An Najashi. From Africa. Subhanallah. When Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu in the early years of Islam migrated to Abyssinia by the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers had come all the way to Abyssinia to tell the people, to tell the king, these guys are criminals, send them back. The king was a just man, not like today, you hear one side of the story and you pass a ruling on someone. Those were the days when they heard both sides of the story and they really, really made a guided decision. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and help humanity at large to listen to both sides of the story. In Islam, we are not allowed to issue a judgment without giving the other party exactly a fair chance to clarify and to give their view. So when the Muslims were given a chance to give their view, 
and to give what they had to say and they were accused of saying blaspheme against Jesus may peace be upon him Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu read a few verses of the Quran the opening verses of Surah Maryam again that Surah revealed in Mecca it started with those separated letters beautiful separated letters I need to spend a moment to read them Kaf ha ya What powerful verses. And Najashi, he's listening. Negus, his name was Ashama, the king of Egypt, the king of Abyssinia, sorry. He's listening and he began to cry. Tears rolled down his eyes. Amazing. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes down with verses revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Speaking about the tears. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ Allahu When they hear the verses that are revealed by the Almighty, they begin, or you will see the tears rolling down their eyes because of the truth that they recognize. How many of us have cried when we've heard the Qur'an? Here is a non-Muslim who was moved so much by the recitation of the Qur'an that his tears are recorded in the Qur'an. And I'm a Muslim and I haven't cried at the recitation of the Qur'an. But when I hear someone naked singing a song, blasting their bodies from side to side, wriggling themselves from A to Z, and I begin to weep, Oh, a'udhu billah, may Allah protect us. So many of them have turned to Islam because they have seen the impact. And we are still following their old little ways. Yet if you were to look at them, some of them who have turned to Islam, you will see even people who were modeling for Playboy have turned to Islam. Go and check it. You will find it on YouTube. May Allah guide us. So here we are. I've spoken. My time is up. I hope that I've made mention of a little bit of the impact of the Quran. And I hope I've stuck to my topic. And really, I plead with one and all to read the Quran with the correct eye, to make an effort. Without an effort, you will never be able to achieve. We need to learn to love one another for the sake of Allah. And we need to learn to benefit humanity as much as possible. And we need to learn to be peace-loving citizens of the globe. And we need to learn, inshallah, to be from amongst those who are true Muslimin. Islam stands for peace. It means peace and it promotes peace. And I end with that. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah ibn hamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.